Bactris gasipes, which is commonly known as peach palm or pejibe, mm -hmm. there are, as there are for all fruits, a million different names, mm -hmm. most of which I don't know. <laughs> so I just trend to the Latin. Is, is, it a, is it a native to North America or South America? What region? It's, a, it's a South Central American palm that okay. trends into the Peruvian Amazon. Oh, and I am not familiar enough with it to know what soil conditions it prefers. I've been told that it prefers a well-draining soil, uh -huh. but experience uh, tells me that it likes a more waterlogged condition. Yeah. Uh, I have had a lot of trouble finding genetic diversity mm. in terms of what's available in the plant community in Florida. Mm -hmm. Virtually no one has productive trees, and the trees that I've found have been extremely sickly looking. Mm -hmm. It's a multi-stemmed palm and it lives anywhere between 125 and 150 years. Oh, wow. uh, and it suckers throughout mm -hmm. that length of time and produces one raceme of fruit per trunk. And so it's like a banana that way. Yeah. Right? It, it, it matures a trunk and then it has its fruit and then it's a non-fruitful part of the, the continuation, I guess, right? That's exactly. I exactly. See. Okay. And so. it is uh, in cultivation generally highly spiny, uh -huh. which makes uh, management somewhat difficult. I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> the the spininess is not something that I think is minded particularly by mm -hmm. people growing it in an orchard setting, mm -hmm. because from what I've researched, the spiny cultivars are more inclined to produce a quality edible oil, oh, a cooking so. oil. Mm -hmm. um, there are spineless cultivars mm -hmm. that are much more difficult to find, mm -hmm. and the spineless cultivars, from what I've read, uh, produce generally less oil and a higher quality carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. Could you explain to me what the fruit is used for. I'm really interested because you talk about oil and a carbohydrate. How are how are those two products used and, and what's the what's the goal in, in growing the plant? What would be your goal as, as somebody who's growing? It's it's a dual threat plant. It's great when you can have two products uh, emerge from one harvest and that's precisely the case with this particular fruit. Although it's not a sweet fruit, you are getting a, a high quality cooking oil that does not burn at higher temperatures from what I've read. Yeah. Now maybe that's, that's not true, maybe it can't take 400 degrees uh -huh. Fahrenheit, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I look forward to experiencing that. Uh, and once the oil is extracted, you're left with a mash that can be uh, sifted and used as flour. I see. And it's one of the few uh, fruiting plant species that is perennial that produces a high quality complete carbohydrate. Interesting. And in terms of carbohydrate value, it exceeds corn. Really? And in fact, wow. in Mesoamerica, it was the precursor in in the diets there mm -hmm. to corn. I see. For native peoples in yeah. some regions, that was what was grown before before, uh, before maize became widely accepted. I see. So it's it's a it's a very old plant that you're hoping to bring back for production of oil and production of, of a carbohydrate to not necessarily rival but be an alternative to corn or wheat. Exactly. Very interesting. Very interesting. So, tell me a little bit more about the, what you know about the plant. I mean, it sounds like it's a really rare bird, or plant, as the case may be. I imagine it's not so rare in Brazil, not so rare in Peru, not so rare in Guatemala, although I've talked to many Guatemalans and they don't seem familiar 
with this palm. Yeah. I don't imagine it's rare. I think the perceived rarity is more of a product of uh, our location. Yeah. The fact yeah. that I haven't done much traveling. Right. If I had traveled in those regions of the world, I'm sure it would seem somewhat less rare. Mm -hmm. But I think based on the character of the fruit and the plant, mm -hmm. uh, being that most trees are generally so spiny and the fruit does inherently need to be processed in order to be useful, right. make it a plant that's more particular yeah. in it, it might be its growth. Yeah. In, in terms of getting people to grow. Because you need the facilities to process it, right. uh, you need the facilities to store it, and I've heard I've talked with people in Haiti about this tree and apparently it does not store particularly well outside of cloud forest conditions, so really? highland cooler wow. areas. Okay, so, so limited range, limit, limited exposure, a difficult plant in terms of harvesting. Yeah. Um, potentially. Um, so what, what, would, what do you want to do with the plant? What's your goal? Like if you could have if you could have anything you want, like a, a field of these palm trees that you could do anything with, what's the goal? What would you like to see happen? I think the goal is to have a perennial substitute to our typical Western staple carbohydrates. Mm. Uh, virtually all carbohydrate sources, regardless of region of the world, are by and large annual species. And the pursuit of uh, principally annual agriculture is of great detriment to uh, climate, soils, uh, and human culture generally. So any alternative that can be presented and implemented that has a perennial nature is of great value to the world. Fantastic. That's really cool. <laughs> Thank you for talking about the palm tree. I didn't know anything about it. I still, I still uh, don't feel like I know a lot, but I know more than I did. That's that's really cool. Thank um, you. And the idea of propagating something to be an alternative. I love the idea of propagating something to be an alternative to uh, annual carbohydrates. I think that's really neat. I mean, less till is better, right? At least that's what they say on YouTube. Yes. So I guess we'll find out. Yes. But, um, yeah, that's a really that's a really cool. Kind of to have. Um, you had mentioned that there was limited genetic uh, material available here, and maybe the genetic diversity wasn't so great. Is that simply because, um, or is your perception that that's because only one or two introductions have been made to Florida? Is it like a plant that's at USDA? and they've kind of been parceling it out over the years to different people? Or? As far as I know, it's not in the collection held in Puerto Rico. It's okay. not in the collection held uh, at Chapman Field. Really? Uh, I may be wrong about Mayawes, but mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that Chapman Field does not have it. Uh, my suspicion is that someone brought in seed a long time ago maybe from one or two sources mm -hmm. and the uh, offspring of that seed set seed mm -hmm. and it's simply not uh, an ideal genetic line right. that's been right. promulgated in the state. I see. Um, so a lot of inbreeding has taken place over the years potentially and you end up with a weaker result maybe as a... That's a suspicion. Yeah, that would make sense. I think that many of these palms have ended up being grown in Dade County mm -hmm. on calcareous soils, yeah. and this plant is from a uh, soil profile that's naturally more acidic. Mm -hmm. uh, that That's generally true of, of most of the fruit trees we, we yeah. know and love, yeah. and I think is one of the reasons that our experience of these fruits is so different mm -hmm. from the experience of people's in other parts of the world, so it's the, the, Alfa the Alfonso problem. Yeah, the Alfonso <laughs> problem. So it's it's trying to recreate these conditions in a uh, Bill Whitman-esque manner, Ooh, so that yeah. 
uh, we can experience the true potential of these fruits. Mm -hmm. But this is something that's hard to achieve on the scale of 100 acres. Mm -hmm. So the work of popularizing these more marginal fruits mm -hmm. is precisely in the hands of someone like Chris here at Truly Tropical, that it, it can't be done. It, it's not economically feasible to be done uh, yeah. on any broader scale. Right. But that doesn't mean that the work is any less valuable right. culturally. Yeah, that's fantastic. I hope you succeed in finding it. It sounds like a really interesting endeavor. And thank you, because it's a, it's a plan I had absolutely no idea it existed. So I learned something new today. <laughs> and I, a lot of this is hearsay. A lot of this is mm -hmm. conversations, email conversations with sure. development workers in Haiti, uh -huh. uh, people in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. And it is something that is still somewhat of a mystery to me, not even somewhat, a complete mystery yeah. to me. Yeah. At the same time, I've been able to import seed, I've been able to find plants, mm -hmm. I'm making an attempt to grow it, and I hope in five or eight years' time to have something to show for it. That's really so cool. time will tell. Yeah, yeah. And, and now, that, now that this is going out to the world, maybe you can form a group of people who are also growing it in other locations or other countries um, and share some experience in reference to how, how to best culture it. That's um, my that be, that's that my sincere hope. Yeah. That's my sincere hope because I think it has enormous potential mm -hmm. to feed people in marginalized communities. Very. Well, thanks for sharing that. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Mm -hmm.